My name is Amata and in this Red Gaming Tech video I am here with a selection of tech news as well as a small smattering of console news to round out the video. So what do I have for you today? Well, I have Intel naming a new CTO as well as Samsung signing an MOU which could help moderate DRAM prices much to the relief of everybody ever. We also have specs and pricing for the Skylake Xeon D. We have the Sony CEO Kazuo Harai actually stepping down and we also have PS4 unit sales to finish things off. However, let's begin things with Intel, shall we? As Intel this week have named a new Chief Technology Officer who is a fellow by the name of Michael Ma Mayberry and this particular fellow will be responsible for their global research and technology development efforts. Now as well as appointing Mr Mayberry to the position of CTO, they're also a confirmed establishment of their product assurance and security group and also appointed a new human resource officer. Now that's not all he's going to be doing over at Intel, he's also going to keep being the managing director of Intel Labs who cooperate with various researchers around the world and they're working on various interesting things including various things that they actually discussed at CES this year which include excuse me, neuromorphic computing, semiconductors and quantum computing. Now he has a ton of you know, bachelors and PhDs just to make us all look bad really but in all seriousness he has a lot on his plate, but obviously his main thing is going to be leading research efforts into computing and communications. So with that out of the way, let's move on to DRAM, shall we? It's not exactly a secret at this point that this is not a good time to be building a new PC. DIY PC building is a bit of a mess for various reasons. Obviously the price of graphics cards at the moment due to the craze of cryptocurrency mining is not really helping matters, but even before that, memory has been an issue for quite some time. You know, DRAM has been pricey for ages, it feels like. However, we might possibly potentially be seeing some relief in sight as China's National Development and Reform Commission, or NDRC for short, is on the verge of signing something by the name of Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU or MU <laughs> with Samsung that might actually help ease things within the DRAM market. Now this particular piece of news comes to us thanks to DRAM Exchange. Now basically thanks to the rising prices of DRAM in the market which obviously has impacted various aspects of technology as I myself and of course Paul have discussed numerous times now has prompted the NDRC to approach Samsung which led to this agreement which has believed to include details of cooperation in the semiconductor industry and this would include various things such as technical collaboration and expanding investment in China. And further according to one of the researchers of DRAM Exchange, one Avril Wu, we're going to see two key parts of the DRAM pricing be affected by this assuming it goes through. The limited price growth, in fact, in, sorry, in, in the face of the continued tight supply and, of course, extremely high demand, as well as increased focus from manufacturers towards increasing production capacity. And hopefully, this will sort of ease things slowly over time and have, you know, more controlled pricing. Hopefully, the pricing will go down a bit, make DRAM cost less than a kidney, that sort of thing. So, this could actually be one of the key things that helps relieve things somewhat as obviously China is a extremely large importer of DRAM unsurprisingly given that it's well China so Samsung are obviously going to be like all right we don't want to upset you very much so you know let's try and work something out here try and see if we can kind of help each other out here because you know the DRAM prices are definitely not helping things as well as of course the whole cryptocurrency mining thing so you know this is not going to be like a magic one and a bing everything's better you know DRAM is now five pence you can get it down the corner shop with, along with your cola bottles but it is definitely going to be better hopefully fingers crossed so with any luck it'll become less of a mess we'll have one component that isn't you know overly inflated due to you know issues in availability and production like we've had with GPUs over the last couple of months However, let's move on to our next segment, which of course is going to be the Skylake Xeon D. As we have various SKUs being revealed here. Now, there is a very interesting article written by Paul. He is well enough to arrive and not well enough to record, unfortunately, due to his voice being all mashed at the moment due to his cold. So that is going to be linked below. If you're at all interested in giving it a read, I would highly recommend you do so. But the first thing we want to tackle here is the Xeon D2191 which is 
an 18 core and 36 thread processor. So obviously that means good old Mr. Hyperthreading is paying a visit. Now this is going to have a base lock of 1.6 gigahertz, as well as a 24.75 megabyte level three cache and a price tag of 2,406 US dollars. Unfortunately, aside from the TDP of 86 watts, that's pretty much all the information we have. There's no information on like memory or anything like that. So, you know, do take all this into consideration. However, next up we have the Xeon D2161i, which is a 12 core, 24 thread affair which has a base clock of 2.2 gigahertz, 16.5 megabytes, megabytes, excuse me, VL3 cache, and a TDP of 90 watts, and a much more manageable price tag of 962 US dollars. Yes, that is still extremely expensive, but it's not like, hey, here's your entire paycheck if you're lucky for one particular item. The final one that we have revealed is the D2141i, which is only eight cores, and it has 16 threads with 2.2 gigahertz frequency and 65 watts. So basically this means that the battle in the higher end things between AMD and Intel isn't exactly going to be put to bed anytime soon. Of course we discussed the rumours the other day of the AMD Starship which is going to have 70, sorry, 78, 48 Zen cores and 96 threads. However other details at the moment are extremely foggy so it's hard to say exactly what's going to be happening there. But let's just put it this way, neither AMD or Intel are backing down from this particular battle anytime soon. And to be honest, I don't really blame them given, of course, the increase in interest in you know AI and deep learning and that sort of stuff. You know, both of them definitely have footholds to gain in that particular market. So let's move on from our tech segment to our next couple of console segments. And our first one, of course, is going to be about Sony CEO Kazuo Kazuhari. And we have an official press release from Sony who basically said that Kaz is going to be replaced and he's going to be stepping down obviously as chairman of the board and he's going to be replaced by the chief financial officer Kenichiro Yoshida who was hired back in 2013 as their strategy chief. Now I do have a bit of a statement here from Kaz who said quote ever since my appointment as president and CEO in April 2012 I've stated that my mission is to ensure Sony continues to be a company that provides customers with Kando to move them emotionally and inspires and fulfills their curiosity. To this end I have dedicated myself to transforming the company and enhancing its profitability and I am very proud that now in the third and final year of our current mid-range corporate plan, we're expecting to exceed our financial targets, and it excites me to hear more and more people enthused that Sony is back again. As the company approaches a crucial juncture when we embark on a new mid-range plan, I consider this to be the ideal time to pass the baton of leadership to new management for the future of Sony and also for myself to embark on a new chapter in my life. My successor, Kenichiro Yoshida, has supported me closely since returning to Sony in December 2013 contributing extensively beyond his remit as CFO and acting as valuable confidant and business partner as we took to the challenge of transforming, transforming excuse me, Sony together. Mr. Yoshida combines a deeply strategic mindset with a relentless determination to achieve defined targets and the ability to take a global viewpoint. I believe he possesses the breadth of experience and perspective as well as the unwavering leadership qualities required to manage Sony's diverse array of businesses and as such is the ideal person to drive the company forward to the future. So basically the TLDR of all of that is Kazuo Harai is stepping down and we're going to be have Kenichiro Yoshida taking over. Definitely the end of an era for Sony. He has been president and CEO of Sony since 2012 so it has been quite a while with him at the helm and obviously we have had Sony come back from a bit of a troubled time to being, you know, pretty much top dog for quite a while in the console space. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see where Yoshida takes Sony. And as Kaz himself pointed out, he has kind of been there for quite some time kind of guiding Sony to where we have seen it come today. Now, he spoke to Variety some time ago and basically said that his emphasis was on technology and the technology sector. And you may recall how Sony kind of, you know, flung the luggage that was sinking them, which is, you know, the smartphone business quite a while ago now. And Yoshida was instrumental in stripping back that business to try and stem the bleeding. 
So he definitely has an eye for like, look, you know, this segment is an issue. It's weighing us down. You know, we've got this huge gaping hole in our company, just bleeding money everywhere. Like, let's not if we can avoid it. And obviously he was, obviously it wasn't him, him on his own, but he was instrumental in being like, look, we need to kind of get rid of that or minimize that as much as we can. And obviously that was definitely a contributor to the success we have Sony come into. So I definitely think it's going to be interesting with him at the helm. But obviously, as with any large corporation, it's not going to be just down to him, but it is very much going to be influential, of course, because he is in the top position. So on a Sony note, let's finish up with some news regarding the PS4 sales. Obviously, we just had Microsoft's financials and, of course, how well the Xbox has been doing. So it's only right that, of course, we follow up with Sony now that they have revealed their earnings for the third quarter of the fiscal year 2017. So the three months ending December the 31st saw the sale of 9 million PS4 consoles, which is actually down a little bit from the 9.7 million sold the same quarter last year. So if we go off their report back in October, this kind of brings the total to roughly 77 million units. But, you know, give or take some there, I'm, I'm basing it off estimations. So that is an impressive amount of consoles that are out there in the world. And before the end of the month in March, so obviously March 31st, we're going to be seeing, according to Sony's expectations, 2.5 million units sold, bringing the total to 19 million and 1 million units below financial year 2016. So overall, the Gamer Network Services segment, which obviously does encompass all of PlayStation, that being hardware, software, and PSN, did see an increase of 16.2% in revenue compared to Q3 of last year, and it went from 617.7 billion yen to 718.0 billion yen. However, they have lowered its forecast for the overall division for the fiscal year ending March the 31st, and apparently this is due to some release dates being changed. And it, they didn't really name names, but it's obviously various high-profile titles that maybe had been delayed or not had release dates yet. And maybe they expected to, to have certain titles out before the fiscal year ended so they could have them on that fiscal year report. But obviously that hasn't happened. However, overall, sales and revenue did see an increase of 11.5%, equivalent to 23649000000000 billion. An insane amount of money, I'm sure you will agree. Overall, however, the financial year was very strong for Sony, showing a 15.7% increase over Q1 to Q3 2016. So basically, unsurprisingly, we did see Sony do extremely well for itself. So we saw you know, a slight decrease in compared to last year in terms of the amount of units sold. However, overall, the gaming segment did really, really well for Sony. Not exactly a shocker, to say the least. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.